Okay, uh, why don't we get started? Uh, welcome everyone again to our Citrus Research Exchange. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Ravi Namana. I'm the Executive Director for Services and for Healthcare here at Citrus. Um, I have a uh, number of announcements uh, as usual, um, and we'll go through these before I introduce our speaker. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Infineon for uh, sponsoring this wonderful lunch. Um, and uh, as you know, they sponsor the lunch every, uh, for every Citrus Research Exchange. So if you see anyone from Infineon, be sure to thank them for that. Um, and then the uh, second issue is also that this um, event is being webcast and recorded. Uh, it's being webcast to all our, our uh, uh, fellow campuses in the Citrus um, uh, in Citrus, uh, that includes uh, Santa Cruz, UC Davis, uh, and uh, UC Merced. And uh, we also record this and post it on uh, the Citrus channel at YouTube. Uh, so if you haven't been to the Citrus channel, all these talks are up there. Uh, if you want to send someone a link, you can have them uh, view it if they miss this talk. Um, then finally, um, there are a few events. Uh, first, everyone is invited to our big holiday gala and special theater performance. Uh, that'll be held Friday, December 12th at 4 p.m. Uh, in Hearst. Um, second, they, we have a couple of distinguished speakers. Uh, there's some very dynamic speakers. One is Jamie Kaufman from IBM. Uh, I have some announcements here, and they're also on the Citrus website. Um, Jamie Kaufman is, uh, handles healthcare uh, for IBM, and he'll be speaking about public health affinity domain for Middle Eastern Consortium of Infectious Disease Surveillance. He does some really interesting work in using modeling and simulation for infectious disease, so if any of you are interested in those topics, he's, he's an excellent speaker. Uh, and then we're very happy to also have Fries Arne Peterson, uh, who's the Danish ambassador to the United States, um, on Friday, December 5th, uh, in Sibley Auditorium. So Jamie Kaufman is Monday, November 10th at 4 p.m. Uh, in 290 in Hearst. And uh, Friday, December 5th is Sibley Auditorium for Fries Arne Peterson, uh, the Danish ambassador to the U.S. So uh, without any ado uh, more uh, delay, let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Sebastian Tunison. Tunison. Uh, he's the executive director of the Claussen Center for International Business Policy at UC Berkeley. Uh, he'll be giving a talk today on international business development, applying managerial skills to social, environmental, and healthcare problems. Uh, Sebastian is adjunct professor at the Haas School of Business and executive director of the Claussen Center. Um, he manages international business development, uh, the international Deve development program, and the seminars in international business development at Haas. So as uh, if some of you don't know this, IBD sends uh, teams of consultants to work on projects all over the world, and it's actually quite a remarkable program. I've actually had a sen uh, chance to look at this. Uh, I think you're, you've finally hit 67 to 70 countries. Is that right? Yeah, it, it's 67, so it's remarkable. So please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Tneeson. Thank you very much. Um, I... Um I promise not to have a whole lot of text on the slides, but I thought I'd give you, this is the blurb that uh, was actually put into the poster for the session today. And what I had a really tough time doing and getting ready for this talk is to pare down all of the things that we work on and try and f uh, look at those that have uh, the word technology somewhere in it, because this is Citrus and we're supposed to be talking about technology, I guess. But what we do is, or what I, uh, I'm going to talk about, is in particular our international business development program. And for, I've struggled with how to describe it, how to define it for a while, but basically think of it as a management consulting firm housed in the Haas School of Business. And our consultants are our MBA students. And teams of our students work on projects all over the world. And in many, many cases, we are working with technology, and uh, those technologies are actually very often being used to try to make uh, the world a better place. We send out 20 teams of students, four, teams, or four students per team each year. We've had more than 1,000 students go through the program, uh, more than 150 clients. Uh, many of them come back year after year, so we must be doing something right. We've worked in about 67 countries so far, and if you look at it on a map, we're not everywhere yet, but um, unless it's a country listed on the U.S. State Department don't go list, uh, we're ready to, to take on the work there. We have had clients, big and small, uh, widely recognized and never recognized, and each of these um, uh, logos represents just one of the clients that we've had. And I'm going to be talking about specific ones as we go. But as you can see, they're American companies, foreign country, uh, companies, uh, big uh, 
co companies, small companies. Uh, I'm sure there's logos here you've never seen before. The, the little turtle there is actually from uh, the uh, UC Berkeley managed research station on the island of Morea in Tahiti. Uh, but there are other companies that uh, you would read readily recognize. Um, government organizations, uh, you, you name it, we work for them. In fact, if you try to categorize it, we work for pretty much everybody, corporations, governments, NGOs, universities, research institutes, uh, and one individuals, startups as well. So what I wanted to do is to talk about some of our projects and give you a quick glimpse at some of the projects that we've done. And then from there, hopefully, I can take the time to talk about those projects that are of specific interest for you. One of our success stories is uh, a project that was actually started in 1998. Patrick Awu and Nina Marini, two of the, uh, the two people featured in the photograph here, they were both students at Haas. And they asked if they could have a team under our program to go and uh, do the, a feasibility study for the establishment of a private nonprofit university in Accra, Ghana, that would focus on computer science and uh, business. So they took a team, they surveyed 3,000 people in the course of three weeks in Ghana, asking uh, potential students, parents, potential employers, uh, what it would take to be successful in setting up a university there. Based on the strength of the recommendations that, or, or the strength of the results of those surveys, they said, we can do this. And they developed a business plan. They started a foundation called the Eschesi Foundation, uh, housed in Seattle, and they started raising money. They eventually set up a Shesi University. It's been running now. They've graduated four classes, I believe. And Patrick has uh, really become the epitome of what it takes to be uh, a leader in, uh, uh, in, in the education in Africa. And he's being recognized for that. And the Shesi model is actually being copied. And uh, they're trying to do it elsewhere. But over the years, uh, we've had seven or eight teams work for a Shesi, everything from looking at the uh, marketing strategy for the school to uh, asking the question whether it was time for them to expand into uh, new areas such as nursing or a medical school, whether they should um, uh, be uh, working with companies on an internship basis, all things that, that we've, we've done uh, with our teams. Still in Ghana, we had a team go to Ghana in 2005. And they worked with a very small organization that had started feeding kids in some of the primary schools, eight schools as a matter of fact. And the question was, is this something that could be expanded nationwide? Could it be grown to the level that it could actually feed all the four million or so malnourished kids in Ghana uh, of school age? Well, the report prepared by the students was brought back in about June of 2005. And shortly thereafter, it was presented to the UN Millennium Task Force on Hunger. One of the members of the uh, task force, uh, a former uh, executive from Unilever uh, from the Netherlands, went back to the Dutch government. And he was in talks with the Dutch Minister for Development and, and was trying to get them to promote an expansion of this program. And the Dutch minister said, if we had a plan that made it feasible, that showed that it was feasible to roll this out on a nationwide basis, we would support it. And the uh, Unilever executive took the report prepared by the students, dropped it on his desk, and he said, we've got one. The long and the short of it is that the Dutch government agreed to support this program, feeding these kids, these kids using locally produced food to the tune of $25 million a year for 10 years. We're now working in more than 1,000 schools, feeding uh, close to uh, half a million uh, kids, and they're still moving towards uh, covering the entire country. There's a lot of difficulties in working in, in, with the project, uh, as you can imagine, trying to get something like this going on a nationwide basis. But we've had teams of our students each year working with it, trying to make it uh, better. And we'll be sending teams to, to move back uh, to, to work on that in the coming year as well. It's got the interest of the Gates Foundation and others, and they may be supporting this as, uh, as well. Still in Africa, the Savi Valley uh, uh, Game Preserve the Savi Valley Conservancy. It's the largest privately owned game preserve in the world. They asked us to come up with some way of improving the livelihoods of the village surrounding the, uh, uh, the ranches. And they thought a microfinance operation might make sense. So we sent a team to evaluate the potential for microfinance operations uh, there. 
And it turned out that trying to borrow and lend money in Zimbabwe, now it seems ridiculous, but even then it turned out not to be possible. So the team came up with an alternative strategy that allowed the, the uh, villagers to increase their income potential. And they um, had a, a fairly good result. But the really surprising result out of all of this was that when Mugabe's um, army or former army people came in and tried to expo expropriate the game preserve, the local people rose up and they said, no, these are good people. They're trying to do good for us. You are not taking this away from them. And the villages actually prevented the expropriation of the lands. And as a result of uh, work that one of our teams had done, which was really unexpected but, but quite gratifying. We've done a marketing strategy for uh, rattan farmers in uh, Kalimantan and East Borneo. They were harvesting the rattan. The rattan ultimately was worked into uh, furniture sold by various companies around the world, but almost none of the value of that uh, additional work uh, stayed in the rattan farmers' hands. We developed a strategy for uh, marketing cooperative for them. The plan was presented to the European Union. The European Union ended up uh, supporting it to the tune of 2 million euros. We've done marketing strategies in a number of places with the World Agroforestry Center. In this particular case, the kola nut in uh, Cameroon, but we've also done uh, handmade paper in Nepal. We've done ecotourism in South Africa and, and a number of projects like that. In, this, is, by the way, is in conjunction with the College of Natural Resources uh, Beers and Environmental Leadership Center uh, that, uh, that some of you may know of. We've done ecotourism uh, projects in, uh, on Easter Island as well and have tried to come up with ways of preserving these uh, cultural monuments because they are being eroded and uh, doing that in a way that increased income possibilities for uh, the Easter Islanders. This was our first marketing strategy with the Wildlife Conservation Society and I won't go into a lot of detail but basically what we did is we worked with local women's groups who were already producing uh, a coffee-like drink called Kupesi, a shampoo and honey, and we developed a marketing strategy for them so that they could go out and uh, uh, sell these more effectively and, and increase their income levels accordingly. We did a business plan for a struggling wildlife education center in Uganda, and again, this is with the Wildlife Conservation Society, and we've worked with them in many, many places around the world now. But there's one in particular that I wanted to touch on, and this is something that I'm going to come back to again later on. It's COMACO, Community Markets for Conservation. COMACO was developed because they wanted to stop poaching of uh, wildlife, primarily big game, in uh, the northeastern part of Zambia. And they said patrols don't work. Just telling people not to do this doesn't work. We need to do something else. And what they did is they came up with a way of improving the agricultural output of the villages surrounding the national park. And they said, if we can make it more attractive for people to grow stuff and sell it and make money, they're not going to go out and poach. So Kamako set up a system where they provided inputs for rice, for peanuts, for honey production. And they stood ready to buy it. And they're doing this uh, still now. They're buying these, processing the rice, processing the peanut butter, and uh, packaging everything and selling it. And in order to participate in it, the villagers have to promise not to poach. They have to turn in their guns. They have to turn in their snares. And in fact, they've had thousands of weapons, thousands of snares uh, turned in, and the wildlife is coming back as a result of this. The living standards have gone up. Food security has increased dramatically with this organization. And it's really a model that we believe will work in many, many places around the world. But these are conservationists. These are scientists. They're really, really strong in that area, but they don't have any formal business training, and they recognize that they needed help. So they came to us, and uh, what we did is we developed an overall business plan for them and updated it over the course of the years. We uh, helped a marketing strategy for their products, which are now uh, marketed under a brand called It's Wild in Zambia, but soon to be in South Africa as well. And we actually took what they were doing already, and we helped make it better. We did similar planning in El Salvador for a national, uh, an ecology organization called Salva Natura. They certify um, fair trade coffee. Uh, we helped develop a strategy for them. Back in Zambia, I don't know if you've heard of this, but uh, elephants don't like chili peppers. And what farms had been doing before, uh, before was setting up uh, electrified fences around their uh, farm plots around the villages to try to keep the elephants out. Turns out, however, that um, 
the wire was often more valuable than uh, keeping the animals out of the uh, out of the f uh, fields. So the wire would be stolen. People would forget to uh, close the gates and so on. And uh, the net result is the elephants were still getting into the uh, into the villages. Well, they discovered that elephants really, really hate chili peppers. And if they if you t take chili peppers and you grind chili pepper and you uh, mix it with uh, old oil or grease or so and spread it on rope, spread it on uh, fences of any kind, the elephants won't go near it. And the chili pepper actually became a natural deterrent for elephants. Well, they grew so many chili peppers, they had an, a, an abundance. And they didn't know what to do with them. And they started packaging them as hot sauces of various kinds. And that's where we came in. We developed a marketing strategy for the elephant pepper to introduce their products into the US market. And uh, their products are available in the US market. But one of the uh, things, that, one of the sidelines that came out of it is chances are the Tabasco sauce that you've used recently, the chili peppers very likely came from uh, this operation in, in Zambia. One of our clients in Rwanda, um, we are helping to restructure the uh, national parks and tourism operations in Rwanda. Uh, we're doing a similar project to try and come up with a sust sustainable uh, plan for the protection of two of the islands in the Falkland Islands archipelago. But we're supposed to be talking about technology. I don't know if any of you know Martin Fisher, one of the founders of uh, what was Aprotech, now Kickstart. Right? This organization basically says, if we can make people more productive, sort of like the Comaco idea, then they're going to grow more, they're going to raise their standards of living, and Kickstart is actually producing these pumps. These are foot-powered treadle pumps, and they increase the agricultural productivity uh, in Kenya primarily, but also in Tanzania and other countries, uh, incredibly. Well, we didn't develop the, the technology. We didn't actually even come up with the idea. But what we did is we helped them look at the alternative places to source the manufacture of these pumps. And we specifically looked at China to uh, see what it would cost to have them produce there, who the potential suppliers are, wh and uh, what it would be like to bring those uh, pumps from China to, um, to Africa. You've probably heard about the Grameen Bank in microfinance. In fact, I think you had a talk here about a month ago that touched on the idea of the village phones in uh, Bangladesh and the fact that um, the uh, women in the remote locations would use phones and it, it was a life-changing uh, addition to the village environment. Well, again, we didn't come up with the idea of the village phone. We didn't come up with the idea of setting a um, or creating a, a mobile phone operation in Bangladesh. But what we did do is we developed the business plan for Grameen Phone. And we came up with pricing strategies, rollout strategies, and things like that. And we worked with Grameen Phone for a number of years to uh, uh, help make them run their business more efficiently. Now, Grameen Phone is partly owned by Telenor of Norway. And one of the key guys from Telenor who was managing uh, Grameen Phone, he moved to the Ukraine. And uh, he said he wanted the same kind of thing done there. So we actually had teams working with uh, Kyivstar GSM in the, uh, Ukraine, the third place mobile phone operator there, and uh, came up with a pricing strategy, a business model for them that catapulted them into the uh, first place position in the market uh, for mobile phone operators in the Ukraine. We got the one thing wrong, however, and that is that the prediction was it would take 18 months to move them from third to first. And in fact, it happened in something a little over six months, I believe. So uh, um, this is the kind of thing that, that, that um, that our teams undertake. But you see here there are many Grameen uh, logos on the screen. We've worked with uh, the various Grameen organizations. Grameen Shakti, which is their uh, uh, electronic, uh, uh, sorry, photovoltaic electric uh, operation. We've helped uh, in the marketing and um, expansion of their hand loom uh, weaving operation. Uh, we've uh, done a business plan for Grameen Network that you see there. We, we've worked on many, many uh, areas of the Grameen operation. Water Health International, Ashok Godgill from Lawrence Berkeley Labs. He had some family members die in India as a result of um, uh, cholera, I believe it was. And he said, somebody's got to do something about this. And he developed this uh, UV water sterilization process. And along, make a long story short, uh, the company Water Health International was developed in order to expand this technology out into, uh, um, uh, into the developing world. Well, three of our teams, one in the Philippines, one in Mexico, and one in India, 
looked at the potential for these technologies in uh, the different markets, found the difficult areas, what it needed to be done in order to get these technologies up and working, and provided that information and those recommendations back to the company. And today, uh, they're still operating in those areas. And in fact, they hadn't been operating in India when we were working with them. And India, I believe, is now uh, their uh, biggest market. They've also moved into Ghana and other places like that. And our teams uh, helped make that happen. In India, in Bihar, uh, the uh, Janani uh, NGO brings family planning and reproductive health care to uh, millions of women. They have something like 25,000 rural centers, Titli or butterfly centers, and something like 620 actual clinics with doctors in them. And the, the centers feed into, uh, they feed patients into the clinics. The management and organization of something this huge was really, really mind-boggling. They were using computer systems that didn't talk to each other. Uh, a lot of stuff was still done manually. And uh, we were brought in with uh, funding from the Packard Foundation uh, to help reorganize them. And so we helped restructure the entire organization, brought in new accounting systems and that kind of thing, and allowed them to concentrate on what they do best, which is to bring the uh, health care to, uh, to the people. We worked with people out of the um, School of Public Health here uh, and, and an offshoot uh, organization called Venture Strategies and uh, looked at the uh, sourcing possibilities and at the marketing possibilities for uh, low-cost abortion kits and intrauterine devices. Okay. You know, abortion's gonna happen everywhere in the world whether you believe in it or not. If it's gonna happen, some people would argue it should be safe. And the people at the um, School of Public Health, Health and elsewhere have developed low-cost um, uh, disposable abortion kits that are way, way cheaper and much safer than the alternatives that were available. And one of the things that we did is look at ways of getting uh, the production of these things uh, expanded so we could get economies of scale and so that, in fact, the cost of delivering these services to the, uh, uh, to the uh, women in need would actually be uh, even lower. Likewise, IUD devices. Usually you think of them as birth control devices. But when you realize that, in fact, the a particular IUD device called Mirena uh, gives off um, hormones as well, those hormones had an unexpected side effect of redu reducing postpartum bleeding and um, also reducing anemia amongst really, really poor women. So the question is, this Mirena device that sells for something, I'm guessing, the five, six hundred dollars here in the US, it's totally unworkable in the developing world. So we looked at ways of uh, getting this produced at much lower cost. Uh, I went back to the original uh, uh, de developer of the device in Finland, and uh, we've been very, very um, sub strongly supported by people to try and get this to happen, because the amazing thing is so many women are dying from anemia and from postpartum bleeding. This is a possibility where uh, a, a technology intended for one purpose was actually uh, used elsewhere. We worked with Yaviskala Science Park, now known as Yaviskala Innovation uh, Center in Finland, and it started out with the idea of um, remote monitoring of machines that make uh, paper, for mezzo paper. And the idea was that you could adjust the um, machines remotely if there's any wear, any adjustments in, and quality of production and so on needed to be done. You could do it from a central location. But they said, hey, th we can do the same thing uh, in other areas. And we actually looked at the potential for rolling the same technology out in the healthcare field, in particular taking care of the el elderly, monitoring their health from a, lo uh, from a, a remote location. And we uh, came up with an estimate of the costs of uh, rolling it out, the costs of operation, and so on. I could talk about a lot of these uh, projects. Each of these really represents something that we've done somewhere. And I'll just give you one uh, quick line on each. And hopefully, in the discussion section, I can address those that uh, uh, you want to spend more time on. In Costa Rica with Linkos, uh, we helped uh, look at the potential for bringing uh, shipping containers that were turned in essentially into uh, cyber centers. Uh, call them uh, uh, mini internet cafes, if you will, in one half of the center and a small medical examination room and, med and, a, and, a, and a medical clinic in the other half. 
linked by um, uh, wireless technology, powered by solar technology, and the question was, is this something that could be uh, made sustainable? And we uh, uh, participated in the study with Hewlett Packard and others there. Uh, I already mentioned Grameen Shakti. In, the, uh, Saudi, uh, in Saudi Arabia, we helped restructure the uh, electrical uh, power delivery network, the company that does that, um, for the uh, Saudi government. Interesting story there, 9-11, this was in May of 2001, 9-11 came along and uh, we were supposed to continue the work over the subsequent years, but since the U.S. government decided that it wasn't going to give any visas to Saudis to come into the U.S., we became political pawns and uh, we in fact um, couldn't continue the work because we wouldn't get, couldn't get visas to go into Saudi Arabia. We've worked with governments as well. Uh, two years ago, we worked with the government of Macedonia, uh, developing the IT strategy for an entire country. Uh, looked at what was done by, by comparable countries elsewhere in the world, and uh, we come, came up with a strategy for Macedonia. Um, word of that leaked out, and Albania said, well, we want the same thing. And uh, just this past uh, May and June, we had a team working in, in Albania, and there they looked at developing an entire uh, education process that would bring uh, the Albanian IT industry into, um, uh, the, let's call it, into the 21st century. You probably recognize most of these organizations, but we've worked with all of them at one time or another uh, on uh, projects. Uh, in MSI Cellular, we looked at the potential for using mobile phones as a payment device in Africa. Uh, this was about five or six years ago, so now it's common sense uh, in many places to be doing that, but we did this at a time uh, when it was still a pretty novel idea. Um, Lucent Technologies had our teams look at the market potential for 3G wireless in uh, China, and on the strength of that work, they got a $92, $92 million contract uh, to supply um, equipment uh, into, into that industry. I've already talked about uh, Kevstar and Grameen Phone. Uh, Nokia has been using our teams for the last few years to um, c uh, see about the commercialization of new technologies. Nokia has, as many of you probably know, this incredible research center and this research capability, but if their research uh, findings are not in line with their mainstream business, then often they don't get, go anywhere. If it, if it doesn't directly serve the mog mobile phone um, part of their business, they've got great ideas, but um, what do they do with them? So they've asked us actually lo to look at the uh, commercial potential for, uh, for many of those. I said I was going to come back to Kamako because uh, this is one that uh, I think is uh, it's close to home, and I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Zambia is one of the poorest countries in the world, the second highest rate of deforestation in the world. Uh, people are cooking mostly over uh, three stone fires and um, making charcoal and using the charcoal if they're not cooking directly over the fires. Komako says we have to do something about that because otherwise even if we save the wildlife, even if we improve the standards of living of the people, uh, we're going to have some major e environmental problems. So. Ashok Godgill, I mentioned him before at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. The other project that he's working on is the Darfur, or Berkeley Darfur Stove Project, which I'm sure that uh, most of you know about. That's the stove in the center of the, of the slide. We were asked to see if we could take that stove and make it work in an environment not like Darfur where we've got uh, civil war, but just in a, in a developing country. So the team, their task was, can we source this stove locally and will it work locally? Will it satisfy the needs of the villages? The villages currently are uh, cooking on either the three stone fire, as you see in the top picture on the left, or on charcoal braziers, as you see at the bottom. And the team was hoping that uh, they would find a way to make this uh, center stove uh, workable there. Turns out, going to the punchline, it's not going to work. It's way too expensive, and it doesn't meet the uh, needs of the people in, uh, in Zambia. But it started the team looking at what are the alternatives. And um, two of the stoves, the rocket stove and the GECO stove, which are already there, have potential with some adaptation to be used there. But the kind of work that the team did in doing this is they surveyed uh, a lot of people in both the uh, urban or peri-urban area and in the rural area. And they came up with this kind of uh, analysis of fuel use and source of fuel, uh, both in the dry season and, and uh, in the wet season. 
And they did this for the, uh, again, I'm not expecting you to, to look at all of the details, but just to get a flavor for the kinds of things that, that we do. They looked at the rural, and they discovered that the rural and the urban users are very, very different. In the rural area, you have people who gather their wood, cook over a three-stone fire, and uh, never pay any money to cook at all. In the urban area, people tend to use charcoal, and they buy their charcoal, and they use the braziers to cook with charcoal. The result is that we've got two very, very different needs, two very, very different kinds of uh, cooking, and uh, one stove is not going to satisfy both of them. But in order for anything to satisfy them, we have to make sure that it's uh, financially uh, feasible. And one of the th things that the team came up with is uh, this um, chart or heat map that shows the, uh, compares the efficiency of the stove with the cost of buying that stove and the number of weeks of uh, payback, really. And they did this through a fairly intense uh, survey of uh, use, uh, quantities of um, uh, wood used, and quantities of charcoal used, and so on. And on the basis of this, they were able to uh, make recommendations about which stoves uh, should be adopted, what price range, and so on. And um, in fact, we are continuing with this work right now. They're going to be doing a pilot project in, in uh, the, the, the coming year. Uh, in both the uh, rural and the urban area, subject to getting some money to fund this, by the way. So I've only given you a smattering of the projects that we work on. We actually have worked on quite a few uh, more projects, hundreds of them over the years. And we've had some pretty good press, too. Uh, this is a Forbes cover a few years ago. Um, it, it really says it all. Is uh, These teams of students do incredible work. Um, but we're not. You know, most of you are engineers. You guys invent really neat stuff. You do really, really good research. And you have ideas of where to apply it. What we do is we help you in um, making those projects work by looking at the, the uh, market side of it, by looking at the business side of it. So in the coming year, we're going to be doing that for some organizations uh, like this. Uh, Google has just announced a fairly big initiative in Africa. And we're going to be working closely with them to uh, uh, help bring uh, some of their uh, technologies in, into Africa. Nokia will be working with them again in the coming year. VTT, the uh, uh, Finnish research uh, organization, will be working with them. And Tekus, who uh, has been very closely uh, associated with uh, Citrus, will be uh, uh, taking a team again this year as well along with uh, the other ones like Wildlife Conservation Society, Salvantura, and so on, and Atonus, which is a, uh, a Brazilian medical device company that I, I didn't mention yet. Uh, we'll be working with them. So that's just an example of the kinds of companies and organizations that we work with. And I don't know if you remember the BASF uh, slogan that was out on uh, uh, television for a while. It says, we don't make the paint, we make the paint better. We don't make the uh, plane, we make the plane better. I would say the same thing. We don't make these projects or programs. But what we do is we help make them better. And that's really um, uh, what we can do. Uh, think of us as in a support role. Uh, helping people roll out technologies, helping people roll out ideas, helping people um, make uh, living standards around the world better. But like I said, we don't start them. We just help. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, questions and, uh, and a discussion. Let's thank our speaker, first of all. Thank you, John. Um, there will be, because we're a webcaster, there'll be two microphones, myself and Yvette in the back. Uh, so raise your hands and wait for the microphone to come to you so you can be heard on the, on the webcast. I'll take one up in the front. Yeah, it's a great project. Um, where does the funding come and about how much does it cost? And then what kind of follow-up do you do for all these different projects? OK, uh, good question, actually, because we don't get any money from uh, the university or from the business school to run this. Uh, we're self-supporting, so we sell our services. And if you want one of our teams uh, off the shelf, the uh, price that we're quoting these days is $30,000 for a team. So if you're Nokia, you're Cisco, you're Hewlett-Packard, and so on, that's the price. 
I almost wish I could turn off the microphone now for what I'm going to say next, but um, if you're a small NGO and um, you're struggling and 30,000 is uh, something that uh, uh, makes this uh, infeasible, we'll work with you. Uh, we won't work for nothing, but what we'll do is we'll come up with a budget and we'll see if the budget is something that's manageable. And we send, as I said, teams of four um, and they will work in Berkeley from January to May on the project and then in May and June they travel to the, to the destination country. Um, we'll get them there and we'll house them um, as part of that budget but they certainly are not staying in uh, uh, five star accommodation or, or anything like that. We'll make it as, as uh, affordable as possible. And in fact that's one, one thing that, that uh, I would say a lot of these people working on these teams if you wait just a few weeks longer and they're finished with this program, you can hire them if you want th uh, as uh, they're working at McKinsey or Bain or BCG and I've done a rough calculation of what it would cost to get the same kind of team, the same kind of work out of one of those consulting companies and we're looking upwards of two, uh, 250 to $300,000. So when you look at that and you see what, uh, what we're charging, it's pretty cheap. In fact, I've been told, and Carlo, you, you were there, I've been told that our price is too low and we should actually raise it by the folks in Finland. So. Other questions? One over here. As far as the timing, um, you mentioned that you work on the projects from January until May. Um, a lot of these scenarios are very local, have very specific local constraints and things. How are your students and your um, faculty able to get that local flavor in that first time period? It seems like that would be a great disadvantage not being on the ground. We do have constraints, time constraints, and in fact, we're a year-long cycle. Let me tell you the cycle first, and then I'll try to come back to that. Uh, at, right now, I'm very unpopular because, around Haas because two days ago, I announced the 80 students that were admitted to the program and also rejected a similar amount who didn't get in, and um, they are not very happy. The ones who didn't get in are not very happy with me at, uh, at the moment. So we, have, we start in October with this competitive process to get into uh, the program. Now, between October and uh, January, I'm working with uh, clients and potential clients, uh, defining the project, uh, putting the um, uh, teams together, and so on. And they start working on the project in late January. So it's our time cycle. So January to May here in Berkeley, May and June in, um, in uh, the country that, we're, that they're assigned to. And then there's follow-up in the fall semester, uh, again, back in Berkeley. So, that cannot satisfy all of the, the needs that you mentioned. Um, in some cases, we, uh, we work remotely. In fact, in many cases, we will work remotely with the client. Um, Skype is fantastic or similar things, the you know, weekly conference calls. Uh, in other cases, the clients will travel here. In some cases, the clients are local. But uh, the thing is that um, we have a lot of work to do remotely, first of all, because we're working in other countries, but we're, we're located here. Um, that means that we don't get every project that we could potentially contribute to because of this. And, and that's just a fact of life that I have to work with. They are students after all. In fact, um, I tell them we've got two objectives here. One is to give a really good project and a really good learning experience to the uh, students. And the second one is to do a really, really good job for our client. Uh, but if I have a conflict between the two objectives, the client's win client wins. We are going to satisfy uh, the needs of the client first because if we don't, um, they're not going to come back. So there are lots of really nice projects. There's one in Cambodia that uh, it was a result of work we did in Cambodia uh, this year, and I was asked if we could continue it. Um, but they wanted the answers, uh, the finished work, by uh, the end of this month, actually the end of November. I couldn't do it. So what I did is I um, put them in touch with a consulting company that could actually take on the work. We tried to find a way to make it work this semester, but it couldn't. So much to my chagrin that I had to give it to somebody else. But. Other questions? Okay. Oh, one more. Can you? I'll go over there. Uh, my question is just give uh, let's get a better sense of the range of of technologies you cover. How do you cover technologies? Do you usually are you usually um, Con um, do you usually have to deal with students' ideas first, or do you usually f find that you have to meet a company and then you discover a technology that you're going to use by working with the company? How, how does the technology emerge usually? Okay, if I understand your question correctly, let me try to answer it. If not, uh, you put me right. on the right path. But we're not discovering technologies. People come to us 
for help in working with ideas and technologies oh. that, that, that they've, oh. that, you know, like Nokia, for example, they've got these technologies already. They say, what can we do with it from a commercial point of view? Right. Well, my question is a little different. My question is more, um, you're working with uh, business students, and it looks like in some cases you're, you're having, you have to, um, you have to choose between different projects. So what I'm trying to figure out is, does is it not, for example, say for example the case of uh, one of the companies that has the phone, mm -hmm. is, or wouldn't wouldn't the choice of the technology or the type of technology that a company has affect some of the kinds of things you may be able to do in terms of whether you can help them or not, or does that factor in? That's a question. Yeah, I don't think it's a t technology specifically, uh, but there are some cases where um, the question that they ask might be so technology heavy that, remember, we're business people. Uh, our students, many of them come from other backgrounds. We've got engineers, we've got uh, accountants, we've got doctors, you know, we've got uh, people from all walks of life who've decided to come back and do an MBA. So if I, uh, for example, a team that uh, will be working on wireless technologies in Finland, it's very likely that I've got some Japanese guy who uh, worked with um, NEC or Docomo or someone like that who has come back to do an MBA who really likes the idea of going and working for a, a, you know, a, a Finnish um, mobile company. Um, but there are cases where we also just don't have the um, technical ability. Uh, and uh, there, either the client has to provide the techni technological expertise uh, or maybe we have to pass on the project. I hope that answers that. I don't. Okay. Question in the back. Uh, I was wondering how public at large could participate in these kind of programs. Sorry, yes. could you repeat your question? I was wondering how public at large could participate in your program. The public at large, how you could participate. Well, there's two ways, and only two ways, which either case probably <coughs> moves you out of the realm of being the public at large. One of them is you can take on a team. You can hire a team to do a project for you. Uh, the other one is uh, enroll in the MBA program. <laughs> so, uh, I, but uh, in terms of uh, other people working with us, um, we haven't. We have worked with local partners. For example, we did a project uh, with Ar in Armenia, and um, we had the um, uh, some local students uh, from the Armeni American American University in Armenia, I think. Uh, a team of four of their students and four of our students, so they became a team of eight students and worked uh, on the project that way. So that's people outside of our program, but I don't think it's really, short answer is I, I don't have an answer for you. Other questions? <clears throat> Would you talk a little bit more about uh, scaling, taking something, one of your projects that works on a, a village and then scaling it to 10 or 100, 1,000, 6.8 billion? How do you scale up to where you hit the whole planet? Well, um, first of all, <coughs> I'm not an expert on any one of these projects. I put them all together, and I should, to give you a complete answer, I would get uh, the, the team that worked on it to come in and talk to you. But in general, uh, what you really have to look at is the, the logistics involved, the uh, supply chains involved. I'm thinking of the school feeding program in Ghana, for example, which uh, specifically was to find the food produced locally and used to feed the kids in the schools locally. So the idea is that you don't have ships full of uh, US aid grain arriving in Ghana and have that distributed, which is the model that works in most places, you know, uh, Catholic Relief Services or uh, the uh, World Food Program will have major pro uh, shipments go in. And then they sell some of the um, uh, very rice or grain that, that's uh, delivered to that country. They sell it and use that money to pay to uh, buy the fuel to truck the food into the area. They destroy the local um, economy for those grains uh, in the process. So when we're talking about scale, what we're looking for is uh, how can we get local uh, farmers to produce for the villages around them. And what we're really trying to do is to develop an organization that organizes that, that uh, manages it, but that keeps the production, uh, production local. We were working with the government in Ghana um, to make that happen. And um, the, what the, we really came up with, with a, was a system of um, regional centers. 
and uh, distribution would be uh, more on a, on a slightly regional basis. But if you get too big, too, ma you know, too few centers over too big an area, then you lose the whole purpose of this, which was to get the local farmers to grow more food, raise their standards of living. I'm not exactly answering your question, but I'm just trying to give you an example of the kinds of issues that, uh, uh, that, we, that we're struggling with. One more. Could you expand a little bit um, what you talked about earlier and, and what the MBA program looks like? Are these first year uh, MBA students? Are they second year? How does the follow up fit into that? Okay, uh, that, that's a good point, and I should have mentioned it at the outset. These are all first year MBA students. Um, they uh, started their MBA, their two year MBA program in uh, late August this year and they will start working on the projects in January. So they will have completed one semester of their MBA program when they start on this. And that's actually one of the biggest issues that I have in, when I'm dealing with potential clients is they say, oh, students, what can students possibly do for me? You know, they're still wet behind the ears. But when you look at the average MBA student that comes through our program, they've been out of their undergraduate uh, program for an average of five to six years. They've been working in um, very responsible businesses in uh, quite a range of companies. Um, it could be, as I said, for consulting firms or it could be for engineering firms. But in many cases, it's more focused than an MBA. And they've decided now that they want to come back and get a, uh, a business uh, side to it. So they have been doing this kind of work already. Uh, and as a result, they come in with very, very good uh, experience sets and by the time, if you sent out one student to work on a project like this, it would be hit or miss whether they could do the job. You send out four of them, and you're blown away. You're amazed at the quality of the work uh, th that they do. They, uh, they force each other to new, higher levels. They become passionate about their client and about the country and about the project. And every September, by the way, put this on, if you're interested in this, September 25th, uh, in, it's the last Friday in September, I have an international business development conference. And all of the teams present to, uh, you asked how the public could get in? Come to this conference. Um, they um, present to their classmates, to the university community, to potential clients. Uh, we've got a, a, a big mix of people there um, for the whole day, and they present uh, the results of their work. Now, of course, when we're working for individual clients, we have um, uh, confidentiality agreements, and in many cases we can't divulge all of the work that uh, we've done for them, but they can tell a, a story that g at least gives you a sense of the kind of work that they do. But the work that they do is, um, is, is astounding. And by the time they've worked on this, each team thinks that they've got the best team, the best client, and the best project. And as long as they, I hear that, I say, hey, we must be doing something right. Uh, because they, they really, really do become passionate about it. And they go on and do things, in many cases, uh, way beyond the, the narrow confines of this program, and they stay involved with their client uh, for many years. We had, have you heard of Revolution Foods? Okay, Revolution Foods is uh, feeding um, low-income kids in the Bay Area. It would, it, uh, you know, one-sentence description. The two founders of that each worked on one of my programs, one in Ethiopia and one in Ghana on the school feeding program, and they, I won't say that they got their idea of Revolution Foods from this, but they actually uh, made a lot of connections and brought in some of what they learned from, the, uh, from their work in this program into Revolution Foods. And not coincidentally, um, some of the uh, seed money that they uh, got for Revolution Foods came from the very same person who helped uh, fund the, uh, one of these projects. So th they found their, 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 some of their money that way as well. We have time for one more question. Uh, I was wondering how often a, um, a, a local organization must be set up to continue or sustain the work that has been uh, pioneered by the teams, or if there's uh, always some uh, local government that you partner with that picks up the slack when the team is, has gone away. OK, we don't create. Uh, organizations or entities to start something in most cases. I would say the, the um, e well, actually in every case, if we just work on something for three weeks and leave, it's going to die. You need somebody who owns it. And that's one of the criteria in selecting the projects for this, is we need a client who's committed to this, who has some, who designates somebody to take responsibility for the project and to, to keep it going. So most of the times they're already working on a project and they realize that they need help. 
All right. Um, there's a, I mentioned the project in Cambodia. We uh, did the feasibility study for the establishment of an international caliber uh, high school in Phnom Penh. And uh, it, through a foundation that's uh, based in uh, Southern California, they wanted to put money into uh, the development of Cambodia. And they asked us if, uh, in, uh, if we could do the feasibility study. We came back with a fairly major change in plans from what they had envisioned beforehand. Uh, and it required putting in some uh, extra um, management, shall we say. The, basically, we said, you've got to have somebody on the ground in Cambodia. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So we recommended that they set up something, and they, which they, in the meantime, have done. Uh, but that's the kind of thing where we make recommendations. But there has to be somebody there. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't think it will get finished. And as in any, if, if you go to McKinsey, if you go to Bain or BCG, any of those, and you ask them, has every one of your recommendations been implemented? Have every one of your projects actually resulted in something? And the answer is no. I can tell you about our duds. We've had some where we, I think we've done great work, but for one reason or another, the project hasn't gone ahead. But for the most part, more, for, for, more of them have gone ahead and been successful than not. So. On that note, uh, please let's thank our speaker. Uh, it's very kind of him to come down from high. Thank you. And uh, Yvette.